Now, I'm going to speak tonight about the illusion of free will. And I, I found, to my surprise, this is actually a very sensitive subject. It's, it's sensitive to religious people, of course, because without free will, Judaism, Christianity, Islam don't make any sense, if you can imagine such a thing. But it's, uh, it's also a, a problem for atheists. It's of, of concern for atheists. And it's, it's of concern for everybody because it's, it, it actually seems to touch most of what we care about in life. It, it, it seems to touch notions of moral responsibility and personal accomplishment and the criminal justice system and politics and religion. Just, there, there's, there's so much about our lives that seems to depend upon our viewing one another as conscious agents capable of, of making free choices. So if, if, if the scientific community were ever to declare free will an illusion, as I think it must, ultimately, it would precipitate a far more acrimonious culture war than has been waged on the, on the subject of evolution. So, so the stakes are high. Now I should also say, just as a a warning and point of concern, some percentage of people, I'm only now discovering this by email mostly, some, <laughs> some percentage of people find what I'm about to say actually psychologically destabilizing. I mean, they, they have, they, they, they are, they, it provokes enough anxiety in them that uh, they don't want to hear another word. Now, if you begin to feel like you're one of those people, if, if what I'm saying starts to feel like it's bad for you, or otherwise not, not compatible with mental health, by all means, go, go to the bar. I'll meet you at the bar later, and, and, and uh, I will refund your, your ticket price. Uh, though I'm sorry to say the, the salad you are eating costs $400. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I, I'm not trying to give anyone a nervous breakdown, so, so uh, I will not take it personally if you tune me out. So I, I hope to do two things in this talk. I hope to convince you that free will is an illusion, and that there's no way of thinking about it coherently in terms of what we now understand about the nature of reality. And I hope to persuade you that this truth matters. It actually changes something about the way we view the world and, 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 the, and it changes our sense or should change our sense of, of what it would mean to create a just society. Now, the, the, the popular conception of free will rests on two assumptions. It, the first assumption is that each of us was free to behave differently than we did in the past. If, if you could rewind the movie of your life to some moment 10 minutes ago or 10 hours ago, 10 years ago, you would be able to proceed differently than you did. If you, if you chose A, you could have chosen B. If you became a, a firefighter, you, you could have become a policeman. You had chocolate ice cream, you could have chosen vanilla. It, it certainly seems to most of us, most of the time, that this is the universe we're living in. The, the, the second assumption is that each of us is the conscious author of our thoughts and actions. So that, so that the part of you that thinks and perceives and experiences your life in the present moment is the, actually the author of your thoughts and choices and subsequent behavior. Now, the problem, unfortunately, is that we know that both of these assumptions are false. Uh, the first problem is that we live in a world of cause and effect, and either our wills are determined by a long chain of prior causes, and we're not responsible for them, or they're determined by some random influences, and we're not responsible for them. And no matter how you, you turn this dial between the iron law of determinism and randomness, this notion of free will doesn't make any more sense. There's, there's, no, there's no way of combining chance and determinism that makes sense of free will. And, and consciousness clearly is not in the driver's seat. For instance, there's now a tradition of doing experiments where you give people a very simple choice just to, to push one button, the left button, or the right button. And they can, do, they can, they can push whichever they want, whenever they want. So it's, so, uh, and the only other task you give them is to watch a special clock 
where they can discriminate time very, uh, in a very fine-grained way. And they just have to notice what time it was when they finally consciously made up their mind. What you find, and what, what the, the first person who did this, Benjamin Labette did, a physiologist who, who had people hooked up to EEG while doing this, but it's since been replicated with functional magnetic resonance imaging and even direct recordings from the, from the cortices of, of surgical patients, you find that the time at which a person consciously decides, thinks they have consciously decided to, to push the left button versus the right, come some seconds often, uh, at minimum half a second, sometimes up to five seconds or seven seconds after the brain has already decided. You can tell what the person is going to do before they know what they're going to do by looking at the, the brain data. Now obviously this gap is, is, is fundamentally hostile to the notion of free will because this means that someone could tell what you're going to do at a point in time where you think you're still making up your mind. But, and people have been wrestling with these data for years, trying to collapse this interval, and some imagine that they have. I'm not persuaded by any of those results, but the truth is, even if you collapsed it totally, and the moment your brain decides was in fact the moment that you were consciously aware of deciding, there still wouldn't be room for free will. You still wouldn't know why it is you picked left over right, and you, and you wouldn't have created the conditions of your picking. You wouldn't have tuned your brain to that precise state that, that led to that behavior. And this is not only objectively true, it's not just a matter that the physics of things tells us that free will doesn't make sense. I'm going to argue to you that, it, that it's subjectively true too, that there is actually no evidence of free will in our experience, which, which many people find quite counterintuitive. Now, what does it mean to say that, that someone acted of his own free will? Well, if it means anything, it must mean that he could have done otherwise. He could have behaved differently than he did. And not based on some random influences over which he had no control, but, but because he, as the conscious subject, was in fact the author of, of his actions. But the problem is, is no, one, no one has ever found, found a way of describing how physical processes could occur that would make sense of this claim. So you so consider your generic murderer. They're, they're all generic after a while. But, uh, a person's choice to commit a murder is preceded by a certain pattern of electrochemical activity in his brain, which is in turn the product of prior causes some combination of bad genes and the developmental effects of an unhappy childhood and then whatever is impinging on his brain in, uh, in that moment. The moment we catch sight of this stream of causes re reaching back into this, this person's childhood and beyond and, and out into the world beyond their skin, that his culpability seems to disappear. To, to say that he would have done otherwise or could have done otherwise had he wanted to. It's simply to say he would have been a different person had he been a different person, or he would have lived in a different universe had he lived in a different universe. And, and as disturbing as I might find such a person's behavior, I have to admit that if I, traded, if I could trade places with him, atom for atom, I would be him. I mean, there's no extra part of me that could decide to see the world differently or, or, or could decide to resist the impulse to victimize other people. And even if you believe that each of us harbors an immortal soul, this, this problem of responsibility remains. I cannot take credit for the fact that I don't have the soul of a psychopath. I didn't make my soul. If I had truly been in this person's posi position, if I had the same genes and the same brain, the same life experience, or the same soul, I would have done exactly as he did and for the same reasons. So, so the role of luck in our lives appears decisive. But, but the moral significance of luck, valuing it and making it morally salient, th this poses a problem to us. It seems, it seems to undermine our notion of right and wrong and good and evil. 
mean, consider Charles Whitman. He was a, a, one of the more famous mass murderers in, in U.S. history. In, in 1966, he started by, by uh, his spree by killing his wife and mother, and then he got on the, the clock tower at the University of Texas uh, with, armed with several guns and, and 700 rounds of ammunition and shot people for two hours until he was killed by police. And he killed 14 people and, and injured 32. Now this, he really seemed like the quintessence of evil. And he seems that way until you read his, his suicide note, what was essentially a suicide note because he knew he was going to be killed. Uh, and he said, he confessed that he found his behavior completely inexplicable. He loved his wife and mother, didn't know why he was doing any of this. He had been just overwhelmed by, by rages and, and, and destructive impulses for months that he found it harder and harder to resist. And he recommended that upon his death that his brain be autopsied for signs of physical disease. Now, so they, they did autopsy his brain, and they found a tumor in the hypothalamus pressing on his amygdala, which makes a, a plausible case for, for the, 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 tumor, the tumor's involvement in, in uh, his emotional state and his, his, his impulse control problems. So this changes things. This is when you find out that the, this evil murderer has a brain tumor pressing on his amygdala, he suddenly seems like a victim of biology. I mean, you, you have to be unlucky to have this kind of tumor. Who knows if you had a glioblastoma pressing on your amygdala every hour of the day, who knows what you would do? So I'm, I'm arguing that a, a brain tumor is just a special case of physical events giving rise to thoughts and actions. If we could, if we could perfectly understand the brain of any one murderer, no matter how evil, that understanding of the, the neurophysiology would be as exculpatory as, any, as finding a tumor in the brain. If we could see how the wrong genes were being relentlessly transcribed. If we could see how the, 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 this person's life experience since, the, since utero onward had sculpted the microstructure of his brain in just such a way as to reliably produce violent states of mind. The, the, the basis for placing blame would disappear. Now, now most people think we have a, a subjective, a, st a strong subjective experience of free will. And the problem is just that we can't map it on to physical reality. This, I think, is an illusion. I think, I, I think we actually do not feel as free as we think we do. This, this relies on us not paying very close attention to what it's like to be us. If you pay attention, you can see that you, you no more author the next thing you think than the next thing I say. Thoughts simply appear in consciousness. What, what, what are you going to think next? What am I going to say next? I could suddenly start talking about why we don't eat owls. Why don't we eat owls? They seem perfectly good. Okay, now, no. Where did that come from? Okay. It, came, it came out of nowhere as far as you're concerned, but the same thing is happening in your own mind at this moment. I mean, you've all made an effort to be here tonight presumably because you wanted to hear what I had to say about free will. And now you're trying to listen to me, but you also have a voice in your head that says things. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> and it, 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 says things, uh, it, it, it says things that are completely unconstrained at times by the thing you're trying to focus on. I mean, I, I'm standing up here trying to reason with you. And you, you will think, he does look a little like Ben Stiller. <laughs> Thoughts just emerge in consciousness. We are not authoring them. That would require that we think them before we think them. If you, if you can't control your next thought, 
and you don't know what it's going to be until it arises, where is your freedom of will? Now, some people try to save free will by saying, well, you're, you're more than that. You're more than just your conscious mind. You are, you are the totality of events occurring in your body. So it doesn't matter that you're not conscious of much of your mental processing. It's your, your, the, un, the unconscious neurophysiology of your brain is just as much you as your conscious experience is. The, the problem, however, is that this really is a bait and switch. You, you can't honestly take credit for your unconscious mental life. You, you have, you're making millions of decisions right now with organs other than your brain, which you're not conscious of. But you don't feel responsible for these decisions. I mean, are you making red blood cells at this moment? Now, your body is, hopefully. But if it were to stop doing this, you would be the victim of that change. You wouldn't be its author. The, the truth is we feel or presume an authorship over our actions, over certain and thoughts, over a certain channel of information in our conscious minds that is illusory. So, so how can we be free as conscious agents if everything that we consciously intend is caused by things we did not intend and of which we are entirely unaware? We can't. So what, what does this mean? Well, first, here's what it doesn't mean. People often confuse any description of determinism with fatalism. So they think, well, if everything's, just, if everything's determined, why do anything? I'll just sit back and see what happens. So I'll just throw the oars out of the boat. Okay, th this is a sign of confusion because, first of all, it's extremely difficult to do. Just, just I recommend that you one day try it. Just stay in bed all day waiting for something to happen. <laughs> It becomes hard to do. I mean, you, you will feel the impulse to get up and do something, and the only way to stay in bed at that point will be to resist this impulse. So, it, so doing nothing is itself a choice that has its own consequences, and it, and it becomes very difficult to do. But the, the, the fact that our choices depend upon prior causes doesn't mean that choice doesn't matter. Choice is part of this causal stream of, of the human mind and, and and our world. So, I mean, so the proximate cause of my writing a book on free will was my deciding to write a book on free will. You, you can't write a book by accident, although some people seem to manage it, frankly. <laughs> so, so my choice to write it was one of the primary reasons it came into being. So, so decisions and effort and willpower and discipline, all of these things matter. These are, these are causal states of the brain that have an effect upon our actions and the world. So, so the choices we make in life are as important as most people want to believe they are, but they are part of the, the stream of causality. And so fatalism clearly doesn't make any sense. The idea that the future is going to be whatever it's going to be independent of what you think and do, that clearly is, is untrue. But, but the next choice you make is going to come out of a wilderness of prior causes which you can't see and didn't bring into being. From the perspective of your conscious mind, you are actually no more responsible for your next thought than you are for your, your birth into this world. You have not built your mind. And in moments where you seem to build it, where you finally take the reins of your life and, and, you, and you, you decide to acquire knowledge or, or learn a new skill, the only tools at your disposal are those which you've inherited from moments past. No one picks their parents or the, or the society to which they were born. No one picks the moment in history in which they live. No one picks their genes or their, the environmental influences that determine the structure of their brain. You, you are no more responsible for the, the exact structure and state of your brain in this moment than you are for your height. So, okay, let's, let's return to this question of moral responsibility because it's obviously what we all worry about. The great concern is that any honest discussion of this, of the causes of, of human behavior, 
seems to throw notions of right and wrong and good and evil out the window. And in fact, that the, the Supreme Court of the United States has said as much. The Supreme Court has said that free will is a, quote, universal and persistent foundation for our system of laws. And determinism is, quote, inconsistent with the underlying precepts of our criminal justice system. So, so the idea of free will, it really is doing work in the world. This is not merely an academic debate. And it, it does psychological work as well. It's a, so, for instance, if, you, if you're taking a nap in the park and you hear a sound, unfamiliar sound, and you're awakened to the sight of a grizzly bear charging at you from across the lawn, the lawn it would be perfectly easy for you to understand that you have a problem okay, without any, imagining any free will on the part of the bear. You have a, you have a, there's an immediate threat to your life. Now, the situation changes in some interesting ways if you swap the bear for a man holding an ax. But the, the introduction of free will into the brain of your attacker is not one of them. Now, it's, imagine you survive this ordeal, and it's, it's a real trauma. And imagine that you're actually injured. You, let's say you lose a hand. Okay, so you have, you have lasting physical in, injury, and you narrowly escaped with your life. Imagine the difference in your experience. Your, your subsequent experience is, is liable to depend far too much, in my view, on the species of your attacker. So, so imagine what it would be like to see the, your human attacker, the person who almost killed you with an ax, on the witness stand during trial. Your, your anger and, and, and hatred of this person might be so intense at that moment as to constitute a further trauma. You might spend years of your life fantasizing about this person's death. How much time would you spend hating the bear? Okay, it seems to me you might even want to go visit the bear at the zoo with your friends. You'd say, that, that is the big one. That is the one that almost got me. You, know, you might be pointing with this hand, however. <laughs> But it would be fun, you would, you would just, it's a, a completely different perception. Which state of mind would you rather have? So the bear clearly was just being a bear. What, what else is a grizzly bear going to do when it finds you sleeping in the park? But the, the psychopath was also just being a psychopath. But this illusion that the man was endowed with free will and could and should have done otherwise, I think accounts for the, 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 the stark difference in, in subsequent psychological suffering. And, and the truth is, 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 many people are worried that, that this illusion of free will is necessary for getting what we want out of life. But the truth is, we can avoid, the, the, the difference between happiness and suffering is just as stark as it ever was. It's, I no more want to be eaten by a bear then I want to be killed by a man with an ax. These are both very good things to avoid. And we can avoid them. And we can encourage people to be as good and as reasonable as they can possibly be without confusing ourselves about the, the, the origins of human behavior. I mean, just think, well, what is it that we most condemn in other people morally and, and legally? It's really the conscious intention to do harm. Now why, now, why is consciousness so relevant? It's because in consciousness, it seems that, that the global properties of our minds get together. The consciousness is where your beliefs and desires and, and long-term goals and intentions rub up against each other. What you, what you do based on conscious, predetermined decisions says more about you than anything else. If you decide to kill your neighbor after weeks of reflection and library research and debate with your friends, well, well, then killing your neighbor actually says a lot about you. The point is not that you are the ultimate cause of your behavior. You didn't, you didn't build yourself. I mean, you, you, the, the point is, you, for whatever reason, you have the mind of a murderer. You're not responsible for the fact that you have that mind, no more than a bear is responsible for the fact that it's a bear. But a grizzly bear really is a grizzly bear. And if you see one outside on the sidewalk tonight, it's worth taking seriously. A bear really will eat you. But we don't have to think about free will in that context. 
So clearly certain criminals are more dangerous than bears and we have to lock them up to keep the rest of us safe. The, the, the moral justification for this is totally straightforward. Everyone is better off that way. But what doesn't make sense is retribution. The, er, the, the notion of punishing someone because they really, really deserve it. That doesn't make sense. Hatred doesn't make sense. We, we don't exact retribution against bears. Actually, that's not entirely true. We used to do that. It, it, it says in, in um, Exodus that if an ox gores a person, the, the ox is to be stoned to death and its flesh cannot be eaten. And Christians took this, this lead and, and ran with it for several centuries in medieval Europe and, and literally had trials for animals, wayward animals, that injured or killed people. There were, there were uh, literally accounts of law, and these, these animals were represented by lawyers. And there, there, are, there are accounts of uh, one lawyer representing a, a colony of rats, and he pled that his clients couldn't appear in court because there were so many cats about willing to do the mischief. Uh, this seems completely insane from our point of view, but it's, it's, it su should suggest to you how, how prone to confusion we are on, uh, on this point. Now, this is also not to rule out the possibility that certain punishments may be necessary for deterring certain crimes or influencing people's behavior. One difference between most people and most bears is that we can be persuaded by the mere idea of certain punishments. But this is a very different view of punishment than retribution. This is a purely pragmatic view of what will deter crime, what will mitigate suffering, what will mitigate risk. So, so d dispensing with the illusion of free will actually allows us to, to focus on what actually matters, mitigating harm, remediating suffering. So I, I'm not arguing that, that everyone's not guilty by reason of insanity. I'm not saying that we can't make these usual distinctions between a voluntary action and an involuntary one, or between the moral responsibilities of, a, of an adult and those of a child. These are important distinctions to make, but they don't track with this sense of free will. In the United States, we have 13-year-olds serving life sentences. And it's, it's not because some panel of experts has found that this particular child could not possibly be rehabilitated. It's because some judge or jury deemed that child the ultimate source of his evil and exacted retribution uh, as a punishment. So it seems to me that certain moral intuitions begin to relax once you take this picture of scientific causality on board. When you, when you have to admit that even the most terrifying people are at some basic level unlucky to be who they are. The, the, the logic of, of hating them as opposed to fearing them and, and, and restraining them begins to break down. And once again, this is, this is true even if you believe that every human being harbors a soul. To be born with the soul of a psychopath is to be unlucky. So, so one consequence of this view, or so I suggest, is that it reduces hatred. Actually, in my view, completely undercuts the logic of hatred. It, it also increases empathy and compassion. Take an example, which I'm... Uh, I should probably get a new example, but, uh, but the example of, the, of the, the worst person who's ever lived, in my mind, at the moment, is Uday Hussein. He's not objectively the worst, but he's, he's about as, the, the, as odious a person as I can think of. Uh, he was one of Saddam's eldest sons. He used to, when he would see a wedding in progress in Baghdad, he would descend with, with his thugs and, and rape the bride, just for the fun of it. Sometimes he would torture and kill the, the bride. He did this more than once. Uh, Whatever you think about the ethics of the war in Iraq, it seems to me pretty obvious that, that given that we couldn't capture him and stop him from doing these things, it was good that we killed him. I mean, unless you are a total pacifist, it seems to me that this is, you have to admit, this is what guns are for, <laughs> to, to shoot people like Uday Hussein. But, but simply walk back the, the timeline of his life. Imagine him as a four-year-old boy. He could have been a, a, a creepy little boy, no doubt. It's quite possible there are child psychopaths, but he was also a very unlucky one. 
mean, he, he had Saddam Hussein as a father. <laughs> How unlucky can you get? He was, he was the four-year-old boy who was going to become the psychopath Uday Hussein through no fault of his own. Now, and, and if we could have intervened at any point there, at four, at five, at six, at seven, that would have been the right thing to do, and, and compassion would have been the right motive. When would compassion stop being the right motive? Would it, would it be wrong to feel compassion for the 18-year-old the Uday Hussein? I don't think so. He's, he's just as unlucky as the four-year-old. So, so ironically, this, if you want to be like Jesus and love your enemies, or at least not hate them, this is a, a, a doorway into compassion for even the worst people who have ever lived, a, a, a taking a, a wider picture of, of scientific causality into view. Now, one thing, one caveat is that this is not to say that this would be an easy view to adopt if you or someone you love was the victim of a violent crime. I'm not saying that in the heat of the moment you should be able to view the world this way, but in our more dispassionate moments, when it comes time to make public policy or to think about ethical norms, I think this is the, this is the view we need to take. So to conclude, I just want to bring this back to, to direct experience. It's generally argued that free will presents a real mystery to us, that, that, that it's, we know we have it, it's subjectively a, a, an incontrovertible thing, and yet we can't map it onto physical reality. As I've said, I think this is a, a, a sign of confusion. It, it's, it's not so much that there's an illusion of free will, it's that the illusion is an illusion. There is no illusion of free will. We're, we're simply not paying attention to the moment-to-moment -moment character of our conscious life. So it's not that it, just that it makes no sense objectively in terms of physics, it makes no sense subjectively either. Thoughts simply arise in the mind. What else could they do? Now some of you might think this sounds depressing, so in closing I'm, I want to attempt to banish that, and no doubt we'll talk about that in the Q&A. The fear is that this takes something away from us. And it does. It takes, the, the main thing it takes away is an, an egocentric view of life. But this can be tremendously liberating. This is, we are not truly separate. We're not truly separate from one another, from our culture, from the world at large, from our personal history, from the deep past. We're linked to everything on this view. We're, we are part of a system. And therefore, what we do actually matters. It matters more, given the, the, the mutually interpenetrating influences here. Our actions in the world and the actions of others matter even more than they, than they would if we were atomized selves, truly authoring our own minds. So. What I'm saying is that you can't take credit for your talents, but it matters if you use them, or it matters that you use them. You can't truly be blamed for your flaws, but it matters that you correct them. Emotions like pride and shame don't make a lot of sense on this view, but they weren't much fun anyway. I mean, these are isolating emotions. What, what does make sense is love and compassion. Caring about the difference between suffering and happiness makes sense. Wanting those you love and everyone generally to flourish makes sense. And of course, none of what I've said makes social and political freedom any less valuable. The, the, the ability to do what you want and not otherwise is still valuable. But having a gun to your head is still a problem wherever intentions come from. But the, the idea that we as conscious beings are deeply responsible for the characters of our minds simply can't be mapped onto reality. And if we want to be guided by reality rather than by the fantasy lives of our ancestors, I think we have to revise our view. Thank you very much.